From coast to coast, live via satellite, it's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord covers the major Christian events in America and across the world with the capability of reaching over 500 million souls with the good news of new life in Jesus Christ. Now from Bellevueland Christian Center in Anaheim, California, we invite you to be a part of the world's largest prayer gathering. Southern California camp meeting, R. Dale Evans Rogers, Dr. Sam Schaefer, Andre Krause, and Candy St. Southwell. And ready to take your call. Some of the most beautiful prayer partners in the world. Now your host, president and founders of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, Paul and Jay. Christian television, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God. He's worthy of our praise. My goodness. With a live wire gang like you here tonight, I want to tell you the devil's in trouble. Yes, he is. We love you and thank you for coming. As usual, this is camp meeting. Don't you remember? You have to turn to your neighbor and give them a holy kiss or a hug or a handshake or something. Tell them you love them. Welcome them to camp meeting. <laughs> it's wonderful to be a part of this great big beautiful family isn't it we love all of you and you at home we love you too wish we could just reach right through the lens of that camera and give you a hug or a handshake but know that our hearts are with you and we love you just the same get the whole family around the TV set tonight get your little tambourines out or whatever and go to camp meeting with us we're gonna have another great night of praising the Lord together amen Let me just run down the row here. We'll meet everybody a little bit better and more perfectly a few minutes from now. But let's at least get, as we say, name, rank, and serial number and have everybody say hello. First of all, what a great host we have here tonight, Pastor Ralph Wilkerson. Thanks for opening Melody Land to us tonight. Thank you for bringing all of our friends here. Okay? Good to have you and Jan here with us these great meetings. We go on next week. And that's good news, by the way. Pastor Wilkerson has said we can go on all next week right here, live from Melody Land. It's just so good. We thought, why not keep going? So we're going to do that. Thank you, Pastor. We love you and appreciate you for that. Hello, Candy Staten Suswell. How you doing, sweetheart? I'm fine. How are you? Doing fine. It's just good to be here tonight. The first time I've been out in 1984, and it's just expecting a great blessing from the Lord. Thank you. God bless you. Hello, cuz. Hello. How you doing? I'm doing swell. <laughs> Happy to be here, and I feel right at home with uh, the Crouches and also <laughs> Pastor Wilkerson. This is actually where I got started uh, in singing and all that out here. So I'm happy to do that. Now this great room is going to ring with music just in a little bit, and it's great to have Andre Crouch and the whole gang's here tonight, aren't they? Uh, quite a few of them. <laughs> They're out there. I see. Boy, drums, percussion. If, uh, all those worldly instruments. If all those, yes, all those really bad worldly instruments. 
if in the midst of all of this, a funny looking little blonde head pops up with a tambourine, that relax, that's Jan. She has always wanted to get in your group somehow, so she may do it tonight. It runs in the family, doesn't yeah. it, Jan? <laughs> And then a little later, I understand Andre has a very special surprise guest to introduce. Is that right? That's correct. And I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'm sure some of you might know him, uh, of them. This is a television first, isn't it? Television first. Oh, get set. This is going to be great. Jan doesn't even know who this is yet. It's going to be fun. It's going to keep your, you know, keep it a secret here. Day 11s, we love you, sweetheart. You're so pretty tonight. I just may run away with you sometime. Oh, it is so good to be here at, at Melody Land. It's been quite a time since I've been here, but I was so blessed the last time. I remember, though, when I was singing here last time, a fire broke out. Yeah, I was right up on the stage, but I kept on singing, you know. I kept, and then finally they put it out. This was not the fire of the Holy Spirit then? Well, maybe a little bit. Okay. <laughs> But it's wonderful to be with you again, and what a pleasure to be on camp meeting. You know, I grew up on, like, camp meetings back in Texas and in Arkansas. And, you know, I was thinking about Melody Land when I came out. You know, the Bible says that we should make melody in our hearts to the Lord. And this is a wonderful place to do it. Can't you feel the Spirit here? Praise oh, God. We've just been having church. I mean we've been having church. Hello, little sweetheart. How you doing? You got the victory? Yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do. You know that you and I met at a camp meeting. We haven't mentioned yes, that. Right. My dad was, was ministering at the camp meeting, and uh, Paul happened to be there. And um, he, he was supposed to go as a missionary to Egypt. And because of Egypt closing uh, during some of the problems times about 27 years ago, he wasn't able to go. And he was resting in South Dakota after quite a time of itinerating to go to be a missionary to, e to Egypt. And he was there listening to my dad minister at the camp meeting. And I walked in. <laughs> and I decided to be a missionary to Georgia instead. <laughs> did, you know, I, I don't know. Did you really think about marriage? Like, I, you know, the first time I saw him, when I first laid eyes on him at camp meeting, I said, you know, that is the man I'm going to marry. That's the truth. I, in fact, after I went home and I said to my mother, as we were driving home from the camp meeting, I said, Mother... I said, how would you like for me to be a missionary to Egypt? That was the first words out of my mouth. She says, what? And I explained to her that I had met the man that I really believed was going to be my husband that night. And it happened at camp meeting. So girls, let's have all single girls raise their hands. <laughs> all, right, all single guys look around. <laughs> it's a great place. I met my wife at a camp meeting. Yeah. Thank God for camp meeting. Yeah. Later. 26, this is 26 years later. But today, let me tell you just something real cute that happened on the way over. Andre's looking the crowd over. Uh -oh. Remember, girls. <laughs> Andre's still single. I have a Some of them are standing up back there, Andre. <laughs> He's getting some glasses on to look the crowd over. <laughs> Does anybody have one of those days when a couple things don't go right and you just... You know what? Today, some things were just not going right, and I began to cry. Just crying and crying and crying and crying and crying today. Crying and crying and crying. I'll call a couple of secretaries at the station, just cry and cry and cry. Call my daughter in law, and I cry and cry and cry. Just one of those days. So, on the way over, I was driving myself over, and I said, Lord, you know, I just, I just really need to hear a little word from you, something from you. And I looked up, honest, please, and the tag in front of me. And they're here because I saw them turn into the parking lot. It has R-E-V, Rev, Re -V, Rev Ms. C. Where are you? Drove a Cadillac. But anyway, what I looked up and it said, there they are. <laughs> I, I would want to tell you how your car ministered to me because I'd been feeling sorry for myself and crying all day. I looked right up after I said, the Lord, help me. And the tag said, smile, Jesus loves you. 
You'll never know what that cat means to me. <laughs> you always need to put something great and positive on your car because, hey, Jesus does love me, and I can smile, and everything's okay. Thank you for that little word, okay? <laughs> we love it. Pastor Schaefer, as usual, is that long preaching leg working tonight? It's working very well, Paul. Um, if, if romance begins at camp meeting, Bonnie probably wishes she had come along. Hello, Bonnie. You know, hello, Bonnie, yeah. Uh, speaking of, uh, of fire falling in here, Dale was talking about that the other night on the uh, answer set in Oklahoma City. Now, it's live there. You don't have time to rerun that tape. Light burned out up overhead, and showers of sparks fell down and caught my coat on fire. <laughs> this was one preacher that was on fire. Are you still burning, Pastor? Now, that, that segment will probably never get on. You'll never see it. But uh, we were calm and cool, except my coat was on fire and the seat was on fire. And uh, fire fell from above, but I don't think it was from God. But, but tonight, fire is going to fall from heaven, and we're going to have a great time. All right. Let's get ready to pray. Let me read a little from the Word. We've been reading out of the Psalms this whole week. Oh, don't those precious Psalms minister to us. I love them so. And Psalm 34 is a very special psalm to me. It's kind of what I sign in all the Bibles, and, and it's just been a special word from the Lord to me. Let me share it with you tonight. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth, even when things are going wrong, sweetheart. Yes. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. There's a wonderful lesson in here. We talk about the fear of the Lord, and you should have the fear of the Lord, and we've not really quite understood what the fear... You know, we're not supposed to be afraid of the Lord, but the psalmist tells us exactly what that fear of the Lord is. Listen to this. Come, ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life, and loveth many days, that he may see good? Okay? Three things comprise the fear of the Lord. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Number one. Depart from evil and do good. Number two. Seek peace and pursue it. There is the fear of the Lord. That's a beautiful little word for us tonight. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Oh, praise the Lord. He keepeth all of his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be 
desolate. May God add his blessing to the reading of his precious word tonight. Join hands with your neighbor and let's agree together that little but we are one. Pastor Ralph, lead this great congregation to the Lord right now. God, I thank you because it's your plan that the church totally be united, not just in name, but totally in spirit. And you told us that inevitably, if we really, truly love one another as you love, that the world will believe. And I thank you, God, because there's a welding together that the total purpose of this ministry of TBN Network is to bring the body of Jesus together. And I pray tonight that the Holy Ghost will fall in this house. Let Jesus be Lord over all of it tonight. We thank you for the glory that's right now upon this place. Oh, God, we know that it was a great meeting when God met Moses and gave him the Ten Commandments. It was a great meeting when the Lord met Elijah on Mount Carmel and called fire down from heaven. It was a great meeting, Lord, when Solomon was in his temple and the Spirit ministered until he just couldn't stand any longer. It was a great meeting, Lord Jesus, when you met your disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. But, Lord, we know that the great meeting of the Holy Ghost falling on the day of Pentecost where the church started is that same fire that burns in this house tonight. But the greatest of all meetings, Lord, is going to be that meeting, not just a camp meeting, but, Lord, we're going to stay there forever. And that's when we see the Lord face to face. And we pray tonight the glory of God will fall upon this house. Let every person here see Jesus in his fullness. In the name of the Lord, amen. 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 All right, let's grab a little pew back here somewhere, and Candy Staten Suswell is coming to lift us in song tonight. A good old hand clapper. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I We're going to begin with an old song that I'm sure everybody knows. You see, part of my life was wasted in sin. I was so miserable that I could no longer enjoy the success that I had achieved. But you see, Satan cannot hold on when touched by the power of God. And tonight I can tell you that I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. He put a new song in my heart. He put joy in my life. And I want you to just help me. Come on. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me.
sing unto the Lord. You may be seated if you can, as we say. Jan, honey, come and bring our beautiful black cousin, Andre. Now, we, uh, we tease a little bit about, you know, being related. And, of course, we are all related right back to Adam anyhow, aren't we? So we're all cousins of one kind or another. Or Noah. Well, Adam and Noah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Andre, you, you had some German ancestry back there, didn't you? Was it great-grandfather or? Well, my, on the Kraut side, I have my great-grandfather, which my father's grandfather was a German Jew. Uh, and my mother's father was also a German Jew. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have a bit of Jewish blood in me also. Yeah. And, uh, well, so put her there, cuz. We really are related. I, you know, the color's not that different anyway. You must be born again. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Andre, um, I understand you have a, a special little guest that you would like to introduce tonight and someone that Jan will especially be happy to see. Yeah, uh, I uh, was thinking today there was a part of the family that you didn't know, and I thought it would be nice to bring her with me tonight. And uh, since we've kind of looked up our background, uh, like a lot of people don't know, I've got something I want to give you. Uh, this is Christina. Christina Krauts. <laughs> I mean, she might as well get some black in the family, right? They always say we're related now. Okay, how, how you gonna do her? <laughs> Take her everywhere you go. <laughs> this is Christina. These things are really, I, I, I didn't mean to get off into that, but uh, since we always say that we're related, I would say, well, let's see how she feels about carrying this little doll around with her <laughs> every day. But these, these are some amazing little things. You know, they have the little adoption papers. I got a little son named uh, Reggie Stan Crouch. And, uh, yeah, that's Christina. Christina yeah, Crouch. Christina Crouch. That's I, I finally have my little girl. <laughs> we wanted Brandon Ball to be a little girl, but now we have Christina Crouch. Welcome to the family. <laughs> yeah. Does she jump? Yes, I see. Oh, she does wonderful. Oh, that's great. Andre, we love you and glad to have you and all the gang here tonight. Give us a little word of blessing and then let's sing and make melody under the Lord. Tell Andre and the whole group you love them tonight. Welcome to the camp meeting. Thank you. I guess my gang will be coming. Can everybody say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Let's say it again. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Truly, I'm grateful for this wonderful opportunity to be able to worship the Lord through song and to be gifted of the Lord, to be able to sing music and play music unto him. Tonight, um, when, when Paul and Jan asked me to come, I'm in the middle of recording and all that, and, and um, I said, we'll try to put something together, but uh, they look pretty good, don't they? We're all colors and everything. Uh, we've got uh, so many of my friends here. Uh, let's just sing something. We'll kind of get warmed up here uh, so I can hear these microphones and everything. Are you glad for the Lord, first of all? See, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm right at home when I'm at Melody Land because uh, I see Brother and Sister Tillman in the audience. And we used to come here with the Teen Challenge Choir many years ago and uh, at the David Wilkerson rallies, and we saw thousands of souls saved and so I trust that many of you that don't know the Lord even watching this program what you're going to see here tonight is real now we in the black churches we never really have what they call camp meeting uh, what would we call it revival, revival. yeah <laughs> no it's right uh, our camp meetings uh, usually it cost to go to a camp meeting it was outright I mean your lodging and all that was we would go to a little storefront church and things like that and that's where we got all our rejuvenation. So our camp meeting songs might be slightly different, but the spirit is the same. 
So we want all of everybody that is here tonight to just worship the Lord. And uh, let's start off with a, a song that's um, my first song. You can call it kind of camp meeting style. And I'm going to ask some of the singers. They never know who I'm going to pick or choose. And I just go, da -da -da -da. they got to be ready. Got to be ready to sing. <laughs> the blood. Oh, the blood that Jesus, that he shed for me. I know it was way back, way back on that cross of Calvary. Don't you know that same blood, it gives me strength. Oh, from day to day, and it will never, never, never lose, never lose its power. Crystal, sing that verse. My doubts. Here's what it does, Jan. Well, it soothes my doubts. And I know it calms all my fears. Mm -hmm. And it dries, it dries. Oh, the blood 
praise Him. How many of you are glad that Jesus is resident in your lives? Amen. You wouldn't have it any other way. You're not ashamed tonight? You know the TV cameras are on you. And I see some people right here in the front that are definitely, most definitely not ashamed to let people know that Jesus is Lord of their lives. Well, Andre wrote a song and we'd like to do it for you tonight. It's entitled, We Are Not Ashamed.
everybody. Lift your hands and sing. He has done the Lord has done great things. He has done great things. Look back over your life and you can say, He has done great things. God that has provided for us. It is he that gives us the ability to do and to have, to even make decisions. Many times people don't give God the glory. They don't give him credit because maybe they didn't pray for a certain thing and they see that they, their dreams and hopes are coming true. And they think that they've done it on their own. But you know what? Somebody somewhere was praying for you. And God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. And I want you to know the reason that we can look around, even those of you that haven't received him, you can see all the blessings that God has bestowed upon you. And Satan would like to get that glory himself or for you to say, I did this on my own. Because God deserves all the glory, and God is the one providing. Satan hates that. Even if you don't give Satan credit, if you give it to yourself, you're robbing it from God. And all praise and glory belongs to him. For there's something about praise. You know, when you tell a child, if you give a child some gum or a piece of candy, most adults will say, Say thank you. Not because we need to thank you or we want them to really know that we are so good. And not because we thrive on those thank yous. But it's to teach that little kid that that adult gave them something they didn't really have to do. They did something because maybe they just loved them. They like their smile. And they are to respond to that which was given to them that they didn't even earn. So it is with God. When we get our priorities straight, when we take focus off of ourselves, we learn to respond to God because of his love. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. We see what he's doing. We see that even though we didn't praise him or, or worship him, he still poured out himself. He still gave. He still provided. Then all of a sudden we're supposed to turn around and say, you love me and I love you for loving me in spite of myself. And tonight, if you don't know him, just take a look around and you can see God's blessings in your life, even though you didn't realize it before, to have health and strength. Those of you that are watching this program, God loves you very dearly. And it's so beautiful to give that love back to him. A song called, To God Be the Glory.
How can I say thanks for all the things that you've done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love to me. And the voice of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to Thee.
sounds like an encore, Andre. <laughs> you know, of all the songs that the Lord has given Andre, there is one very, very special one to Jan and me. This song, and I just whispered to Andre and asked him if he could possibly sing it for us. And he said they could. Jan and I and all of you have gone through many, many trials and tribulations these past ten years as we've seen God bring this great television network into being. And Andre, I will always thank the Lord that he allowed you to write this beautiful song that has ministered to Jan and me probably more than any other song you've written through it all. Before I, I sing this song, I'd like to just uh, say thank you for all my singers, for Sandra, Alfie, and Crystal, and Phyllis, and Linda McQuarrie, Howard Smith, Alex Acuna back there, uh, Bill Maxwell, Frankie, James, Harlan Rogers on keyboards, and Welton on bass. Frankie Cole. They can play too. Uh, if I don't know whether or not you uh, saw the papers or if that's any concern of yours, but Candy Staten just got nominated for a Grammy Award. And, uh, My sister Sandra Crouch made her first uh, album, and it's my sister uh, and my dad's choir, and it's really anointed. If you haven't picked it up, get it. And she just got nominated for three Grammy Awards. First album, Sandra. I'm so proud of her. And all these people here are just uh, multi-talented people. And we work together in perfect harmony. And I get so much from them, you know. And uh, they're right here. I, I love them so much. And I think they know that. And we've been through a lot of things together. And each of them. We're not just up here hooping and hollering. But we know the Messiah. And we, we are always praying for each other. When this song was given to me, um, I didn't really know how much I was going to have to use it. But, and I still don't know how much more I'm going to have to use. <laughs> but I'm ready. I just want to be in the place that wherever God takes me, I want to be just there to go through it or to be able to say yes in every situation and not to complain, but just to go through. And we all got to do that, you know, because he don't have no favorite persons. Right. Listen, right. eat that. I've had many tears and sorrow. I've had questions for tomorrow. There've been times when I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation. Did all my trials come to only make me strong? You see, I've been a lot of places And I've seen millions of faces Oh, but yet there were times When I felt like I was all alone But in my lonely hour It became a precious lonely hour But Jesus reminded me I was his very own. He told me to try to get through it all.
There's a chorus we sang in our little storefront meetings. It goes, yes, 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 yes. 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 How you sing it, Crystal? Sometimes the Lord 
tonight. I got to sing it one more time. Andre, are you willing to stand for me? I told him, yeah. yeah. Oh, you know that I am. Yeah. Oh, mm, yeah. Mm, my soul said yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. perfectly clear that the Lord gave all the musical talent to the black side of our family, didn't it? God bless Andre and all of the young folks. We love them. Let's give them one more great big we love you say. Move on out. Andre's life continues to be a miracle. Most of you know that the Lord raised him up off of a deathbed, healed him, put more songs in his heart and in his spirit, and he's going on doing a great work in ministry for God. Pray for Andre and Sandra and all of the disciples as they continue to work for the Lord and lead many, many young people, especially to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jan, honey, bring our very special friend and guest. We don't even count Day Eleven's a guest anymore. She's part of this family. And we love her very much. The First Lady of the West, Day Eleven's. Heart. You know, I am plain spent. Isn't he something? Oh, I tell you, the spirit just flows from that fellow and flows, and the music the Lord gives him. Isn't that terrific? Oh, don't you love his music? Isn't that great? You know, God is so good to us Christians yes, he is. to give us a place like this to be together and to worship Him freely, you know, and to really express our love to the Lord however we want to, yes. whatever is comfortable with us, the way we feel it. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Oh, so do I. So do I. I tell you, you know, there's a lot of talk nowadays about atomic blast. And there was a picture. We were talking about it in the bus on the way over. Yes, the day after. You know what? I'm not afraid of that because I'm looking for that great day that's coming. Okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord. That is what I'm looking for because you know it says that trumpet's going to sound. And those that are dead in Christ are going to rise. Yeah. 
And those, if we're lucky enough to remain, we're going to be caught up with them to meet Jesus in the air. And we're going to be with him forever. What a promise, huh? You know, uh, Roy and Roy Jr., Dusty and I, have just done an album. And we got such fun out of doing it. I really did enjoy it. Because, you know, Dusty is really a very fine country singer. I'm trying to inveigle him into getting in the gospel field. Because he can really sing. Well, tell him he can practice on us. I'll tell him that. I'll tell him he can practice on you. Okay? Okay. But Roy sings western in this album. And Dusty sings country. And I do some gospel songs. And I got such a charge out of doing some songs with a big band style that I used to do before I came to California when I was back on CBS in Chicago with a big orchestra. So we have kind of a three-pronged album. It's going to be released in February. It's going to be called Many Happy Trails. All right. So I think what I'd like to do, I think I'd like to start with that song that the Lord gave me way back about 33 years ago. Happy trails. Okay? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Happy trails to you. It's great to say hello and to share with you the joy wonderful trails over the past 36 years. It was about 36 years ago, come next month, that I gave my life to Jesus Christ in complete and total commitment, every area of my life. And so, that's why I look forward to that great day. You know, I've been a, Roy and I've had many trails of happiness and trails of achievement by God's grace, trails of sorrow, trails of sunshine. But what a wonderful thing to look forward to that great day that Christians have. See, they never, when they talk about all of this doomsday thing, that's what's going to happen, they never address us at all. Do you know that? Because we've got a promise they don't have. Okay? So I'd like to sing this called, It's Going to Be a Great Day. Okay? Thank you. Remember that? When you're down and out, lift up your head and shout. It's gonna be a great day. Angels in the sky promise it by and by It's gonna be a great day
I had the most marvelous privilege this afternoon, around noon it was. I had a privilege to share my faith with a man they say that is on his way out with cancer. He was a sweet man, and he said that he believed in Jesus, and he said that he always had, but he just never really, I guess he'd never really lived for him and never really studied about him and didn't know him really personally. And so we shared and we prayed together. And I asked him to let Jesus come into his heart, and I knew from his face, we held hands, that he had. And you know, that's a blessing that made my whole day. You know, the Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. Right? That's the greatest privilege we have in all of life, to tell somebody about Jesus. You know, there's been a lot of talk across the years about women's liberation. Folks, there isn't but one real liberation in the world. And that's in Jesus. That's where the liberation is. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And His Holy Spirit is just falling and falling and falling on congregation after congregation. Such a wonderful, wonderful time to be living. Aren't you glad you're living today? Isn't this great? You know, when I was a girl in my soul, what a memory. That's a long time ago. But when I was a girl, we didn't have really, we didn't have all the wonderful meetings like we have here now. And young people didn't know about Jesus to really share him with each other. You went to Sunday school and you went to church. And you figured that you had done God a duty. But you didn't know anything about a life-changing experience about being born again from inside. Like when he comes into the heart, when you ask him, say, Lord, will you just move into this tabernacle that I have? Lord, will you move in there with your Holy Spirit? And will you just come into every room that I have? The room even with those skeletons that rattle. Will you come in there and will you shine it on with your Holy Spirit? And will you just take me over and give me life abundant and make me new, what the Bible calls a new creature in Christ? You see, that's what I did. And that's what I asked this sweet person today to do, just open his heart. You know, one of the most wonderful Christians that I've ever known with the most joy in the Lord was a black woman. She was my idol when I was growing up and when I first got into radio when there was no television. And I used to try to imitate her when she sang because she had such feeling. And she used to sing a song. I was reminded of that when Andre was singing through it all. She used to sing a song called Stormy Weather. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Oh, bless her heart, Ethel. Ethel Waters, a wonderful Christian woman. I remember that uh, my son Tom, who led me to Christ, and his family, and I, and Roy and I, were up at Oakland with Billy Graham at a crusade, and Ethel was there, and she was having a lot of problems with her heart. And... I wanted her to meet Tom. I wanted Tom to meet her, I should say. So I took him over there. I said, Ethel, honey, this is my son, Tom. How are you? How are you, Ethel? And she looked up and she said, Dale, I wouldn't give the devil the credit or the satisfaction of telling you. <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it. Because, you know, he's just waiting to hear us commiserate about our problems. You know that? And to wail and weep and to carry on instead of to say, no matter what it is, he that is in me is greater than you out there. Okay? Right. So I would like to sing a song and dedicate this to Ethel Waters. It was her favorite song. And nobody but nobody could sing it like Ethel Waters. His eye is on the sparrow. This is a tribute to her.
chapter of John, it says, let not your heart be troubled. His tender words I hear, and leaning on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears, and has been a lot of criticism about the television ministries. The devil, he doesn't like that. Do you know that? He doesn't like it because a lot of folks are getting saved and delivered. And so he is really angry. And so he uses people. They don't realize they're being used by him. You know that? We should pray for those people. You know, I get real mad. I get real angry when I read things like that. And then I say, Lord, I know that you're the judge, and I'm not to judge. I'm to pray for those people and to love them. But, oh, Lord, it's hard. <laughs> but, I, you know, and a lot of them get mad because they think, well, you take money for the television ministries that should be going to the local church. Hey, listen, there's a many a person in the local church because of the television ministries. People hear about Jesus. And then they want to get some Christian companionship and to grow and to study and to read God's Word. So, not too well, it's been quite a while ago, I learned a little song that I really captured my ear. The Imperials did it. And it was called, Cast Your Bread on the Water. <laughs> so, I would like to sing, Cast Your Bread on the Water. Now, I have goofed this up about a dozen times. 
but you know, we're among friends, ain't we? Huh? Okay. All right. Okay. So I'm going to try cast your bread. This is pretty honky for a grandmother to sing. I'm going to do it anyhow. Okay. All right. <laughs> Now there are people never receiving one single thing from God at all. Oh, they're just shaking in their believing. When they don't see results, they quickly fall. Gotta keep on casting your bread upon the water. That's a blessing for you. This is a lovely song. Our daughter from Scotland, our Marion, we call her Mimi, sent me the prettiest little poem. It's up on our fireplace in our family room in Apple Valley. It's called An Irish Blessing. And I recorded that in this album I'm telling you about. And I put the music to it. And it's my goodbye to you and my wish for you. Okay? Some folks 
true blue who stand by you and a friendship never ends may the road rise up to meet you may the wind always at your back may the sun shine so the devil knows you're gone. Thank you and God bless you. said something that struck a little fire in, in this old TV man's heart. Yes, Christian television is building the local church. In fact, I, now I haven't taken a poll, so I don't know what the results will be, but I'm going to ask you a question. And long shot camera, get ready to get a picture of this great auditorium. How many of you in this room tonight, either for the first time or from a backslidden condition, came back to the Lord Jesus Christ through Christian television? Let me see you. Hold them up real high. Stand up. Yeah, just stand up. Stand up all over this place. Look at that. Look at that. Hallelujah. See why the devil hates Christian television? Yes. God bless you. Thank you. Oh, my. Well, I've got bad news for the devil. We're staying on the air till Jesus comes. Oh. Just before Pastor Schaefer comes to open the word and give us a good old camp meeting message, I know he's got a word from the Lord in his heart for us. Candy Staten is coming back to sing a beautiful song. Where could I go but to the Lord? So, where could 
congratulations on that Grammy nomination. We'll be praying for you. Yes, sir. It never ceases to amaze me the way the Holy Spirit has put together the team that we call Christian television here. The Holy Spirit's doing it, you know. I'm not smart enough to put this together. I'm just glad He let me be a little part of it along with you. And I'm excited about what He's doing. I even know the Lord picked just the right cities for the first seven stations because He knew in Oklahoma City there was a big, tall oaky out there that could just preach the house down. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we needed that for our foundation. But, Pastor Dan, I want to tell you, these first seven are just the foundation. Because I had a meeting just today with another group. And, folks, I, I'm just trembling, literally, on the inside when I think of the far-reaching import that this meeting could produce. Do you remember the word of knowledge that came through Brother Oral Roberts' back last summer when we were at one of the camp meetings. I, can't, I think it was Pat, Dad Hagen's camp meeting. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Brother Roberts and he said, I, I, I see, and he hesitated a moment, but then it came. He said, I see a hundred stations, coast to coast, the great Christian network that will usher in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh! And I can't tell you very much about what happened today until the right time comes. But I'm going to tell you people, those hundred stations are already in view. I mean, they really are. No kidding. I mean, really. It's glorious. And I'll ever be thankful to the Lord that God picked Oklahoma City for one of those first seven stations. Channel 14, we love you. You're doing great. Oh, Channel 14 is producing some of the best programs of the whole Trinity Broadcasting Network, like The Answer, and Dr. Whitaker, and Betty Jean Robinson, and Marilyn Hickey, and John Avanzini is now producing there, and Richard Hogue is getting ready to do an exciting live Sunday night program right from Oklahoma City. So, Oklahoma, you're doing great, and um, the Lord's just put together such a wonderful, wonderful team, and I'm so glad that he let Pastor Danny Schaefer, pastor of Crossroads Cathedral in Oklahoma City, be a part of this great team. Pastor Dan, come on. Let us give you a love. And then open your heart. Give us whatever the Holy Spirit has given us through. Thank you so very much. What a gracious welcome and how delightful it is to be in Melody Land Christian Center. Yeah. Pastor Wilkerson and with all of you wonderful people, it's just a joy to be able to be in Camp Meeting 84. Aren't you enjoying Camp Meeting every night? God is blessing abundantly. You'll never find this pastor criticizing Christian television. When I came along, I jumped in and started using it to the glory of God. It's filling my church up. Amen. <laughs> wow. We've got to enlarge our parking lot. We've got to pave more acres. We already have 20 acres paved. We've got to pave some more, and we've got to add some seats. Amen. Because God is just pouring out His Spirit. I'm so thrilled to be a part of everything that's going on, and I just counted a privilege just, just to be able to be a part with Paul and Jan and all of the people of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, and it's just doing a work that is so great already and yet just beginning, the islands of the sea and it's opening doors that never were open before. I just received word from Pastor Hale up in Cincinnati, Ohio. On March the 6th, the 7th, and the 8th, 
I'll be up there in the Cincinnati Gardens, 10,000 seats up there. I didn't know anyone up there knew me. That's because television people know me up there. We're going to have a big meeting. You folks in Cincinnati, get ready. In March, we're going to have a time. And I'm so glad to be in Melody Land. And hasn't it been a great service? These wonderful singers with, have blessed our hearts. It's just, I, I don't know how I... A little preacher from Oklahoma could be on with this talent we've had tonight, but <laughs> a little, yeah, <laughs> little inability. Five feet and 18 inches of Oklahoma sunshine. <laughs> one person said one time, said, how tall are you anyway? I said, five feet and 18 inches. He said, I thought, sure, you'd be at least six feet tall. Little did I think when I was a boy and stole milk bottles off my mother's porch to sell for a nickel. Now that goes back further than some of you can remember. How many think milk only comes in pasteboard cartons? <laughs> Sold it for a nickel and went down to the Blue Moon Theater. And I had to do it secretly because my folks wouldn't let me go to the show to watch Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and Trigger. <laughs> and little did I ever think I would meet her in a hotel in Orange County one day and she'd shake my hand and say, praise the Lord, amen. <laughs> That's something. And they... Dale and Roy have been exponents for Christ, outspoken, wholehearted, committed Christians since the days when it wasn't popular for the celebrities to be Christians. They have had a testimony, and because of their testimony, it closed a lot of doors, but God opened a lot more. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added. And they're doing better than ever. God is changing my life. James Robinson was, Robinson was with us at Crossroads Cathedral Sunday night. We had over 7,000, probably more. I want to be conservative. Every available space had a folding chair with someone occupying it, and we opened the three curtains on the huge acting stages up over my platform, and that was filled with people and people standing around the walls. And after it was over and so many had come to God and the people were so challenged, James Robinson and I met in my study and talked for a while. And we agreed that God is bringing his body together as never before. And in order to do that, we're going to have to be changed, folks. We're going to have to lay aside the traditions of men and become united in the Word and in the person of Jesus Christ. And thank God it's happening. And Paul and Jan are at the forefront of this great move. And I told James, God's dealing with my heart and changing me. I, I just don't know how to do it. You know, when, when 12 doctors examine you and take pictures and show you photographs of a cancer... And they tell you that if you don't have radical surgery, you're not going to live. And you travel to three cities and 12 specialists tell you the same thing. You begin to think a little more seriously about this thing called heaven. And I remember the day sitting in an airport in Houston, Texas, when I made the quality decision to trust God to stay off the table and to go with God. And God dried that thing up and healed my body. And I've been going full steam ever since. That's been well over a year. But you think of things in those days that sometimes you don't have time to think about when your full strength is there and you're not thinking about it. And I want to preach a little message entitled, Telling It Like It Is. God's been dealing with me in the night hours. I wanted, kept my grandson last night. He kept me awake almost all night. 
By the way, it's 10 to 11 Oklahoma time. You folks are fortunate out here. I thought I'd get a few winks on the plane, and fortunately, you know, there were just a few people on it, and I could find a seat all by myself and put the arms up and lay some pillows down. Did you ever do that and try to capture a few? St I couldn't do it. God was pouring a message through me, and I was writing all the way out. This is a message that I believe can gain response from those viewing by television because you can do it simply by making a call and without being seen, but I believe people in this sanctuary are going to make a new commitment and a change to God as well. There's one thing, ladies and gentlemen, we dare not guess about, and that's eternal life. You might be nebulous about a lot of things of life, but when it comes to making heaven, you don't want to guess about it. I must know. The Word of God says in chapter 18 of the Gospel of Luke that Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. When I was a young preacher, a younger preacher, <laughs> better qualify that, the Holy Spirit taught me a valuable lesson because I had become involved with a group of other preachers who along with myself had become critics of certain successful ministers. We accuse them of being successful because they let the standards down and were not spiritual. When the whole basis of our criticism was jealousy over those who were doing better than we. And as I prepared a message using as a text Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 21. Where the word of God said, for the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And the Holy Spirit said to me, read it again. Now, I don't mean I heard an audible voice. He said it in my spirit. How many know what I'm talking about? Read it again and listen. We so often read with our eyes, but we don't read with our minds and our spirit. And we don't hear with our ears. And I reread the passage and discovered that I was guilty of nine of the listed sins that keep a person from inheriting the kingdom of God. And I was a preacher. Nine of them. I was stunned. I was a gossip. If somebody had accused me of that term, I would have become angry. 
But there it was in God's Word with the Holy Spirit turning the blazing searchlight of heaven upon my spirit. And I stood before God a gossip. I was guilty of hatred, guilty of bringing variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, and even I was a murderer because First John tells us that if a person hate his brother, he is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Are you listening? Do I have your attention? This brought up a very serious question to my mind. Was I a religious sinner? Was I really born again? Recently as I studied the two kinds of people that are not going to make it to heaven, I found that one is the sinner who refuses to confess his sin and admit who he is, and the other is the self-righteous Pharisee who claims hypocritically to be something that he is not. And I've made up my mind, I don't want to fall in either one of those categories. I want to be saved. I want to have everlasting life. I want to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Don't you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven? We need to face these issues tonight. If anyone else had asked me what the Holy Spirit was asking me, I probably would have gotten angry and answered, of course, I'm born again. But I wouldn't have been telling it like it was. God's Word already had condemned me. I could not inherit eternal life with all of those sins unrepented in my heart. And there's a scripture that bears mentioning right here. Jesus said, Many shall come to me in that day, saying, Lord, Lord, in thy name have we not cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, Depart from me, I never knew you. Sobering thought, isn't it? People that had been actually actively engaged in gospel work in deliverance ministry, banking on that to get them through. And Jesus said, I never knew you. He went on to say, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's not enough just to want to miss hell. Everybody wants to miss hell. Anybody with enough brains to keep his ears apart doesn't want to go to hell. You know what I'm saying? Nobody in his right mind wants to go to hell. But the issue is not just wanting to miss hell. The issue is whether or not we're willing to subject ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and fit in with His eternal kingdom. Because eternity is a long, long time. And let me remind you that hell is not so much a place where God is going to gleefully punish the sinner. Do you think God's going to get some kind of kicks out of roasting you like a wiener? over the fires of hell until your skin burst open. That's not the kind of a God that I conceive of. I'm sure that hell is a place of torment. That's not my subject tonight. But hell is not nearly so much a place of, of tormenting the sinner as it is of an isolation ward where those that are not willing to comply with the will of God and the Lordship of Jesus will be ostracized from those who want to do that. So through all eternity, you and I, if we're going to be willful sinners, will not infect the others that live in the presence of God forever. Now that's a profound statement. Hell is God's isolation ward. It's not because he gets some kind of glee 
out of seeing you punished. But there has to come a time when those that refuse to make Jesus Lord and live by the laws that will bring harmony to the whole family of God universally have to be separated from those who do want to follow God and live by his law. It's time we pay the price and live like God intends for us to live. Are you hearing me tonight? Today we hear much about love and it's wonderful and much about forgiveness and understanding and acceptance and agreeing to disagree and freedom from guilt and acceptance just as we are but not much about sin and the need for repentance from sin. And we have compiled a neat list of words to explain human problems in an inoffensive, unobtrusive, acceptable, non-alarming way. And our pulpits have become so hygienic and squeaky clean that our audience can hear sermon after sermon without experiencing conviction. Is this good preaching? It's heavy, but it's what we got to hear. Not necessarily what I like to preach, but it's what we must hear. God is changing my mind and changing my life. We've got to get back to telling it like it is if we're ever going to come to the knowledge of the truth and get together in the unity of the Holy Spirit around the will of God. We've got to be people that are willing to do God's will. I hear something these days that trouble me a little. Maybe it's because I misunderstand what's being said, but I hear said over and over again this statement, God accepts you just as you are. I have a problem with that. Now, if we mean by that that God loves you in spite of the fact that you're a sinner and you've gone away from God and he will forgive you if you come to him confessing and repenting, then I buy that because God so loved this world he gave his only begotten son. But if that means God accepts you no matter what your mindset is and no matter whether you're willing to change or not, he takes you just like you are and makes you a child of God forever, I've got a problem with that, mister, because someone is out of the will of God and it's not God and it's you and I that have to move if we're going to be in God's will. We've got to repent of sin. God may save you where you are, but he doesn't accept you as you are. There has to be a change of heart. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and all things become new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. First John says that he that committeth sin is of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. First John 3 and 9, that means he is no longer a habitual sinner. Every time a true child of God finds himself involved in a sin and is convicted of the Holy Spirit, he immediately will confess that sin so that God can forgive him and cleanse him from all of his unrighteousness. Hallelujah. God's coming back after a church without spot or wrinkle that has all sins washed away. Do you believe it? Yes. Based on what I'm preaching to you tonight, I must ask myself, am I really saved? I must be sure. I'd rather be unsure about anything else than that. A few years ago, 
The Holy Spirit gripped my heart. I had become caught up in the spirit of competition that is so prevalent in the church world. I wanted the biggest church, the largest attendance, the most conversions. And in my, it's confession time, I suppose, but God has been changing my heart. And in my misguided zeal, I sought ways to pad my Sunday school attendance in order to report big numbers and look good. And I used gimmicks and extensions and reports, and mostly I used my tongue and imagination to report big numbers. Never grew, but everyone thought I was. And while in fasting and prayer for more power and success, but in the reverse order, I was more interested in success than I was power. The Holy Spirit spoke to my spirit, I cannot bless you. Why, Lord? I questioned, the Holy Spirit said, not audibly, but to my spirit, because you are a liar. And he said, while I've got your attention, The sermon illustrations you've been using that sound so great that you've added so much to about your personal experiences, their lies too. <laughs> that hurt. I was shocked. It cut me to the quick. I had considered myself full of zeal for the Lord. Wanting to build a big church for the glory of God. But I did not face the fact I had become a liar. I was not telling it like it is. We must allow the Word of God to convict us and admit our sin and repent or we'll never go on with God. And many of the people that I've counseled with through the years have been reluctant to admit their sin. They admit to having problems, but not sin. But the only ones who ever received lasting help were the ones who would face sin and repent. Now hear me. It's going to get heavy, but I want you to listen. I don't think anyone will tune me off right now. I remember husbands who habitually read sex magazines and books and viewed pornographic movies claiming they needed it to be a good husband to their wives. And when they were told they were a pornographer, they reacted with hurt and with denial and sometimes with anger. It's getting quiet in this first church of the deep breeze. <laughs> The person who came to tell me that he was taking money from his job, I said, how long have you been a thief? It offended him until he realized the truth of it and made it right with his employer and got his sin under the blood. The woman whose husband was a businessman preoccupied with his work became involved in what she called an affair. How long have you been an adulteress? Was the question. She was shocked and hurt. And to this day she's never admitted it. God can't help you when you cover up. Telling it like it is. Are you still with me? Yes. He said, he hadn't got to me yet. Hang on. I'll get a touchy spot before I'm through. <laughs> a 
A young couple living together, going to college, came to me planning to marry after they graduate. Would this be all right, they ask? I said, you're asking me for permission to continue in fornication? They said, we never thought of it that way. And got their act straightened up and their lives in harmony with God. The abortionist doesn't want to be labeled a murderer. The perpetrator of child abuse through incest does not want to be called a person of incest. And you who are viewing by television will find it easier to admit sin and repent. Call a prayer partner and get right with God because it's done by telephone. But people in attendance tonight, God's going to deal with us before this service is over. And this is going to be the greatest service some of you were ever in. Because this is a night when you're going to face up to facts and tell it like it is. And get on good terms with God. You see, man, he's more than body. He's soul and spirit. And the soul is the seat of the passions, the lusts and the desires. The spirit is the will or the volition of the person. The body is the house in which the soul and the spirit dwell. And the Bible speaks of sinful man as being dead in trespasses and sins. <clears throat> this does not mean that the person's spirit and soul and body does not exist. It means what death always means in the Bible, separation from God. Sinner follows his own passions, lusts, and desires. A Christian is a person whose spirit has been made alive to God through faith in Jesus Christ. He operates in his soul and body according to the dictates of his sanctified spirit. We'll never have proper control of ourselves until we become honest in our desire to live right. And true repentance is never a cover-up. It is always a facing of truth and an action calculated to discontinue sin. The unforgiven man is sorry for his sin only when he's caught, and then he's sorry because he's caught. The forgiven person is sorry for his sin before he is caught, and he repents with the purpose of never committing that sin again. He is truly sorry for his sin, not just because he's been caught. Are you listening to me tonight? Satan operates in the area of the cover-up. He's a master of disguise. He can transform himself into an apparent angel of light to camouflage his true nature and activities. And he'll attempt to offer us excuses and alibis and self-justification for our sins. But we will never be a true servant of Jesus Christ until we become honest with ourselves and we face the facts of our sin and we repent and depart from the working of iniquity. Then and only then will God accept us. Say amen, somebody. Yeah. Shout hallelujah. 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 Thank you. First man, Adam, didn't want to face up to his sin. Blamed it on his wife. Some of you guys have been doing it ever since you had a wife. <laughs> the woman, not to be outdone, blamed it on the serpent. <laughs> to be sure, there was the activity and temptation of Satan involved, but the free will of both man and woman was exercised, and they were responsible for their actions. And Satan working with your flesh nature will camouflage sin. He and unrepentant people will try to make sin acceptable. We attempt to take the sting out of transgression and we justify our sinful action. 
But friend, I'm not here to jump all over you or to condemn you. I'm here to tell you the Bible says they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm not here because I don't like you. I'm here because I love you so much. I want to spend eternity with you. And the only way is to begin to do the will of God which is in heaven. And be honest with ourselves. It's amazing how many people have counseled with me through the years that have not had an understanding of the seriousness of their sin. And we dodge reality by substituting less stark and ugly labels for our sin. We speak of having an affair. And this is a phrase to mean that we've committed adultery or fornication. Amen? Amen. It's a Bible term. If a person has sexual relations with another outside of marriage, he's either an adulterer or a fornicator. Let's get it straight. Whether it's you or me or anybody else. Am I getting through? When you use that term to describe a person who comes for counseling, Almost invariably, they'll look shocked and hurt. Adultery is what someone else commits, but they're having a meaningful relationship. <laughs> Their relationship is tempered by extenuating circumstances. The man they're sleeping with has a wife who is insensitive and cold and doesn't love him anymore who may be cheating on him, and he's unfulfilled. So there's a justification for the affair, but not in God's book. Am I still on target? You better clap because you that don't looks like you're guilty. You better keep shouting right now like you were at the first. Or everyone around you is going to start looking at you. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is not one of those leg-kicking sermons, but I'll just do it anyhow. Glory. The man has a wife who's cold and doesn't understand him to fulfill and he seeks outside his marriage. He justifies because his biological needs are taken care of. The wife has a husband who is so involved in work that he rejects her so they excuse what's going on. Or the two have so much in common they really have meaningful conversations and they're good for each other emotionally and psychologically. Let's face it, mister, if you're having sex Outside your marriage, you're an adulterer, God says. And until you admit it and confess it, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Is that plain preaching? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Society has all kind of names for fornication. It's called scoring or making out or making love or doing it, plus a whole lot of others I just as soon not mention. <laughs> Don't sound too bad when you put it that way. But God looks down and says, you're a fornicator. That hits right between the eyes. Goodness. The truth is that if you and your girlfriend are having sexual contact, you're both fornicators. You may be divorced or separated from your spouse, but if you're sexually active, you're a fornicator. The human mind can come up with dozens of reasons as to why my particular case is different. But adultery is adultery, and fornication is fornication, and no amount of cover-up terminology will keep the stark truth from being announced on Judgment Day. We need to face the issue and tell it like it is, my friend.
A husband may read those sex magazines or paperback books or look at video cassettes of sexual activities and explain to his wife that he has to do this in order to fulfill her, but he needs to face the fact that he is a pornographer. And one of the greatest shocks on Judgment Day will be the revelation of how much salacious pornographic material was in the houses and possession of so many professing Christians. They're getting quieter. Now, I don't preach this because I don't love you, but listen, mister, you need to go home and pull that stuff out from under your bed and put it in your fireplace uh, or tear it to shreds in a paper shredder. Let's clean up our act uh, and begin to do the will of God. Now, it's not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, he it is. Hallelujah. How can people face the rapture with that stuff in their possession? How can you? When the Bible says they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's a heaven or hell proposition, my friend. And if we're going to be changed, we've got to start on the basis of holiness and go from there toward Union and unity. This whole scenario of unbridled lust must be dealt with if we're ever to be free. There must be conviction of the Holy Spirit of turning loose of unclean spirits, the fantasizing, the repeated masturbation, the consumption of X-rated materials, the lasciviousness must be faced and admitted and the repentance must be with a godly sorrow, a desire to put away such sin and be totally cleansed from it. But my friend, if you'll come clean before God, you'll feel better than you've ever felt in all your life, and God will wipe your sins away if you'll just confess them. As long as you cover up, they'll never be forgiven. As long as it's sweeping under the rug, it'll never be forgiven. But the Bible says to Christians, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. There is cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ. People that are involved with incestual relationships in the family probably need counseling but not nearly so bad as they need to be forgiven and born again and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. The Bible speaks of many sins. God can help no one who whitewashes his sin, who justifies his ungodly action. Society uses the term gay until we can't even use it anymore in its original intended use because people don't understand. We have strange names that make sin look innocuous. It's really getting quiet. You better say amen now. Everybody's going to be looking at you. But the Bible says such persons are unnatural, perverts, vile, reprobate, malignant. I don't say that in hate. I say it in love. We're going to have to face our sins in the light of the Word of God and get them erased. Hallelujah. And then march on with God. I don't care who you are or what you've done or how deep in sin you've gone or how disgusting you've appeared in the eyes of society. I'm here to tell you there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that blood, lose all their guilty stain. Hallelujah. God will set you free if you face your sin and get right with God.
Hallelujah. Society comes up with words such as ladies of the night. Sounds spooky to me. <laughs> Street walkers, prostitutes. The Bible calls those that are in such activities whores and harlots. Now, I don't say that with any sense of condemnation or judgment, but I say we try to excuse what we are by dressing it up in high-sounding terminology. We talk about heredity and environment and psychosis and neurosis when we ought to come clean before God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and you'll go home justified, the Bible says, if you'll face the facts of sin. Hallelujah. You say, I came to cat meeting to shout, not to be rubbed the wrong way. Hang around. It may save your soul if you listen to what this preacher's telling you tonight. Hallelujah. We want to say that we have problems. But you see, problems can be ignored until we recognize our problems, our sins. We'll never have forgiveness nor peace of mind. Sin is more than a problem. It's got to be confessed, repented of, and forgiven. We speak of stretching the truth. The Bible says we're liars. We talk of people who spread rumors. The Bible said they're gossips and backbiters. We speak of people who use profanity. The Bible said they're railers and blasphemers. We speak of the midlife crisis. Now, I can preach this because I'm past it. <laughs> the midlife crisis. A time when a person excuses his eccentric behavior and his adulterous fleeing with a younger woman or her affair with another man. There probably is a time in most people's lives when we realize that we're getting older, that we've not accomplished all that we wanted to, that life was about to pass us by, but it's never a license to sin. Whether a person is a preacher or a deacon or an elder or a church member or anybody else, it doesn't give you a right to become an adulterer just because you get in a midlife crisis, brother. Get in the blood of Jesus and live right and keep that thing together for the glory of God. Woo! This is sure good preaching tonight. Amen. Just simmer down. Don't become an adulterer or a dirty old man or a reveler. Tell it like it is. Sin is sin. Let's tell it like it is. Let's read God's word with our own needs and condition in mind. We must stop applying all that the Bible says to others. The Bible speaks of many sins. Can I find myself? I don't have time to catalog them all. Adultery, fornication, murder. Perversion, unnatural affection, abusers of ourselves with mankind, liars, thieves, backbiters, covenant breakers, boasters, proud, reprobate, covetous, idolaters, drunkards, extortioners, railers. Now hear me. Does this mean because God is specific in his labels of sin that he hates the sinner? No, a thousand times no. You hear me and hear me well. If God hated the sinner, all he would have to do is nothing. Because we are under the curse of condemnation. 
And because of our sin, we are doomed to be lost forever and alienated from the presence of God throughout eternity. But it's a very act of the fact that God does love us, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. God wants you in the kingdom, and you can make it if you'll face up to your sin and get right with God. Are you hearing me well tonight? The reason God's specific is so you can focus on your sin and become sorry for it and find forgiveness. But until we become specific, we will find no peace. When I deal generally with sin, I may not feel forgiven in a specific area. But when I focus in upon my sin, when I confess the specific thing that's wrong in my life and repent of that specific thing, then I can know that specific thing is taken care of. I'm winding this up, but I want you to listen very carefully. A minister friend of mine said that it isn't right to invite sinners to Christ, but command them to come to God. Now listen carefully. He received opposition of that comment and that concept because we always have spoken of the invitation. Our altar call is called an invitation, but God did not invite people to be saved. He commanded that men everywhere repent. Now listen, it's important. If you're given an invitation, you can accept it or reject it of your own will. But if you are commanded, you have no say so. You either accept it or you rebel. And the Bible said God once winked at man's ignorance, but now he commands men everywhere to repent. That's important. If I give you an invitation, you have an option. But if I command you, you have no option. You obey or rebel. The man Jesus told about sent invitations for people to come to his supper. They all had excuses. So he sent his servants into the highways and hedges, and he said, Now you compel them to come in. The invitation's over. You compel them to come in. And that's a picture of the gospel kingdom. God did not give the Ten Invitations. He gave the Ten Commandments. Now, it's important what I'm saying. I'm not being cute. It's important what I'm saying because it determines whether you're going to be in the kingdom of heaven or not. The kingdom of heaven is not found in joining a church, being baptized or sprinkled or shaking the preacher's hand. If you think being baptized or shaking a preacher's hand is going to get you to heaven, you might as well sign your name on a barn door and shake a mule's tail. It's not going to work, folks. <laughs> it's going to be when we face up to who we are and what we are and we call what we are what it is, and we repent, confess, and God said he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, you get ready. I'm going to give a command tonight. I want everybody viewing by television to get ready to call and to let us pray with you and to give your heart to Jesus Christ. And all of you that are in this service here tonight at Melody Land Christian Center, I'm going to make a command. If you are committing adultery or fornication or homosexuality or perversion of any kind or incest or habitual masturbation or pornography or any other sex sin, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to repent, to get it under the blood and to get yourself into the kingdom of heaven because you're not there right now. Are you hearing me?
If you are a gossip or a nagger or a criticizer or a backbiter or a spreader of rumors, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to repent because you're not a member of the kingdom of heaven until you repent and get forgiveness for those sins. Are you hearing me? If you're a drunk or a dope user, a cusser, a taker of God's name in vain, a violent temper, a reveler, and a partier, I command you in Jesus' name to repent. And if you are bound by drugs and you excuse them because they're the prescription variety, but you're just as hopelessly shackled as that one that abuses it from the illicit street sale. You need to repent and get rid of that and face the issue and get right with God. Let's come to terms with Jesus. Here tonight. I don't want anyone leaving this building right now. The Holy Spirit is just settling in upon here with his touch of conviction not to condemn or to make you feel bad but to turn you loose and to let you go home freer than you've ever been in your life because you finally faced up the facts and admitted who you are and what you are and you're going to come to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want every one of you, the nature of my message has been specific, but it's also been general. But there's one thing, sure, if you're going to be worried about what people think or what they're guessing, then you're never going to please God because you better obey God rather than man. And that person across the aisle has nothing to do with your eternal life. He can neither save you or let you go to hell. But there is one that can destroy both soul and body in hell. And he's the one I want to be sure I'm in favor with and all right with. When I face the facts, no matter who sees or who knows, no matter who cares or who doesn't care, I care. It's my soul. It's my life. It's my eternity. I want to be right with God and it's my business. I've heard Dwight Thompson preach long enough to know that you don't bow your heads or close your eyes in melody land. This is one sermon that'd be a whole lot easier if we could. But we're not here to please men or displease men. We're here to get right with God. That's the essence. And as I talk to you in a little bit, I'm going to start in this section and come right around. And I want to see hands raised for those that want to do some repenting and some praying. Doesn't matter if you're a church member or a deacon or a preacher or whoever you are. I preach a message along this line to a bunch of preachers in a camp meeting and the altar filled up with men that were pastors and evangelists that were getting honest with God. Brother, there's a shaking going on and we better get in. And I'm here to tell you that if you're an adulterer or a fornicator or a homosexual or given to perversion or insult or cest or habitual masturbation or pornography or any other of these sins, I command you to be saved. If you're a gossip, a nagger, a criticizer, a backbiter, a spreader of rumors, I command you to be saved. If you're a drunk, a doper, a cusser, a taker of God's name in vain, a person of violent temper, I command you to be saved. Stand on your feet everywhere. Nobody leaving this auditorium. Everywhere stand up in Melody Land Christian Center. And while God looks on, I want us to face facts tonight. And if you will, I promise you, God will touch your life. How many in this section need God's forgiveness and God's help in your life? Get your hands up. Get your hands up. Woo! Right here. How many? Get your hands up right here. How many? Oh, my, 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 my. How many right here? How many? How many? How many? The hundreds.
hundreds and hundreds of hands are going up. Get down here around this altar. I'm going to pray for you tonight, and God is going to set us free. I command you to repent in Jesus' name. Jesus is here to set you free. Come on. And let's face these issues square as God wants them face. Hallelujah. This is one of the most beautiful sights you'll ever see. When people get honest with God, that's when you're going to really make progress in spiritual things. When we get rid of the sin. Now the altar call tonight has been very clear and specific. I don't believe anyone has misunderstood I believe you know exactly why you've come. And I want all of you to repeat this prayer after me. And you that are viewing the television at home, repeat it after me out loud. Out loud. Some of you husbands have that pornography under your bed. Your wife's not going to understand, but I'm telling you, she's going to be so glad when you come clean and admit what you need. Whatever your problem is, I want you to pray it with me out loud. And you that are here in Melody Land, I want you to say it so loud that they can hear it ten people away. Not only can you hear it yourself, but let's say it with boldness because this is the very moment that God is going to set you free and you're never going to be the same again when God's through with you tonight. Oh, hallelujah. What a beautiful sight, and God loves you, and I love you. And I'm not here to condemn you or point a finger of condemnation. I'm here to say, let's face facts, and let's get forgiveness and go on to heaven together. Amen. Are you ready to pray? Say it with me out loud. Oh, God, oh God. I'm, a I'm a sinner. I haven't been honest, haven't been honest. in areas of my life. But I'm facing facts tonight. tonight. I'm confessing my sin. sin. I put it in my mind right now. now. I'm confessing it it. before you, God, God. and asking for forgiveness. forgiveness. For you said in your word, word. if I would confess my sin, You would be faithful and just just to forgive me of my sin sin. and cleanse me me from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. Evil spirits spirits that have control of my life, life. I reject you now. I I refuse to allow you entrance anymore. I I cast you out of my life in the name of Jesus I want to be clean I want to be free I want to be saved I want to have everlasting life I believe it I claim it I know God that you now cleanse me from all unrighteousness In Jesus' name, name. the heaven is broken, the The sin is erased, erased. my heart is pure, my My life is clean, my My name is in heaven, I rejoice rejoice. in my salvation, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Hallelujah. Now don't ever be the same. Don't ever be the same. Don't go back. Don't pick it up. Leave it under the blood. Doesn't it feel good? (laughs) Oh, doesn't it feel good when you face it? 
and get it out. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory to God. I love you so much, and God loves you, and we're going to heaven together. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Thank you, Pastor Dan, for that heaven-sent message. We'll never be the same after hearing it. And now the Word of God says, Be not hearers of the Word only, but be doers of the Word. Those of you that have received Christ for the very first time especially, what I urge you to do, I think we all know that very wonderful number by heart, 731-1000, huh? Go to the phone, either from home or in the morning, anytime, and dial that number and give us your name and address and we'll send you a Bible, a new birth certificate, some other things that will help you and bless you. Those of you who are giving your lives again to the Lord, coming back, being reclaimed, as we say, coming back from a backslidden condition, we want to hear from you, too. We have some special things we want to send to every one of you. Praise God. Oh, this has been a wonderful night, hasn't it? We thank you, Pastor Dan, for that word from the Lord. Amen. I'm sure telephone lines are jammed right now, but to our viewers at home, don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Keep calling. Keep dialing the number on your screen. And if for any reason you don't get through tonight, then write the number down and call at other times when the lines are not quite so jammed. We want to hear your beautiful confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Candy, state and come, angel. Sing a song of invitation as people come to receive Jesus Christ. Thank God for that amazing grace.
when I was out there in the world, out there doing my thing. Praise God, I wasn't worthy for God's grace, but he loved me anyhow. Sometimes over the dangerous highways, danger seen and unseen, he kept me sane just for today. Hallelujah. And I just want to praise my God tonight. I want to do you feel like praising him tonight. Oh, yeah. I just want you to join with me and praise the Lord. Everybody. Praise God. good news coming in and you know what we've got time I think Candy you you sing a little song that just couldn't fit more perfectly it says sin doesn't live here anymore let's let's just go out singing that song but honey real quickly where are the precious souls calling from Mary from Amsterdam New York Gloria from Midland Texas Price from Spring Hill, Pennsylvania. Bud from Bethany, Oklahoma. Terry from Anderson, Indiana. Roy from Juneau, Alaska. <laughs> Children, Grand Junction, Colorado. Indiana, Poughkeepsie, New York. Hamilton, Ohio. Oklahoma City, Moore. Miami, Coral Springs, Florida. Miami, Miami, Miami. Oklahoma City, Phoenix, and Anaheim. <laughs> Oh, praise God. Praise God. Camp meeting goes on tomorrow night. Who's going to be with us? Laverne and Edith Tripp, Candy Staten, and we forgot who else. <laughs> but it's going to be good. It's going to be great. We love you. Come on back, and then remember, we're going to go on all next week with Praise the Lord live right here from Melody Land. Next week is Nikki Cruz. Shirley Boone, Mario Marilla, Hal Lindsey, and Jesus. Yeah. Our special guest is Jesus. Hi. Tomorrow night, Dave Reaver. Oh. Dave and Brenda Reaver and the trip. And Candy Satan. Wonderful. A great night. How many will be back to see me tomorrow night? God bless you. And some of you folks out there across Southern California, come on back. We're just going to go out singing tonight, okay? Candy, we love you, Angel. Come and sing that song, and let's make this all our testimony tonight. This body of mine is his temple. His home away from home And I must keep it spotless For him It 
must stay ready for his coming. Swept clean with truth and love. That's why sin doesn't disappear anymore. to let sin reign in our mortal bodies, to obey the lust thereof. Our bodies are the only temple that the Holy Spirit can dwell in until Jesus comes back. And he said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Church, he's coming back. I said he's coming back. And every eye shall see him. And every tongue must confess that he's Lord of lords. <laughs> and he's King of kings. And he'll reign. Oh, yes, he'll reign. you've been with us for praise the lord if you haven't asked christ into your life call the brother now and pray to receive jesus as savior and lord if you'd like an audio cassette of praise the lord please don't ask for program 112-84 that's 112-84 if possible tuck in a love gift to help defray the cost of the tape ministry TBN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So right today, praise the Lord, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Paul and Jan would like to thank you for your prayers and financial support. You keep us on the air. Thank you. This is Jim McCullum saying, God bless you. And remember, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. This program was brought to you by the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout the United States of America.